So um, we have seen a lot of knowledge graph technologies, very much focusing on the database side of things, including um, query languages and data formats and a bit of data quality, which is also very close to data management questions, of course. Now, this is not the only things that you can um, be interested in when you are considering knowledge graphs. And there are certainly other topics that one could also um, study in a more um, extensive course, um, possibly also uh, in future versions of this course, um, but not in this year uh, with uh, 2021 being a um, corona lockdown year where we have to shorten a bit. So for this time, um, the end is near, so to speak, and we will only cover one last topic um, that uh, is meant to widen our horizon a bit, also to make us appreciate some other aspects that graphs in um, data analytics in particular may also have. And um, this topic is um, what is called centrality. Now, centrality is an aspect, as I will explain shortly, of network analysis. And you can already hear from that, that somehow how graphs are involved. But as we will see, graphs in slightly different sense than what we have studied in knowledge graphs so far. So welcome back. My name is still Markus Krulch and you are still watching the video series on knowledge graphs in this course of TU Dresden. So, um, the question I would like to address today is how to find important notes. What do I mean by that? Well, query languages, of course, give us a lot of ways to find relevant tuples uh, of vertices in a graph or simply relevant vertices. So we can filter by many conditions. We can express many requirements. But in many practical applications, we don't just need to retrieve the right set of results. We also need to somehow order them with the most important notes on top. Now, what is most important is obviously not easy to tell because query results in um, a query language as such are matching the query. So they are not better or worse than any other query result. And there's uh, no obvious criterion by which to order them, rank them in their uh, in their uh, property of being results to a certain query. Now, of course, that's not quite true. We can order results of queries, and that's also a possible solution to this um, problem. So we could use the query itself to order results um, by stored or freshly computed values that are naturally ordered. For example, we have seen that in Wikidata's Sparkle endpoint, there um, is the number of Wikidata pages uh, included in the data um, with the property Wikibase cycling. So this is for every node a number which indicates how many Wikipedias have an article on a certain subject. It's a bit more than just Wikipedias, but roughly this is the meaning. And this indeed can be a useful metric to estimate an item's importance. If many languages write about it, it's probably widely relevant in a global sense. Um, it's not the best metric, obviously. It has a lot of um, cultural biases, but it gives us some indication of what might be more interesting than other things. So the most famous composers, for example, will have more articles than the not so well-known ones. <clears throat> Another way to achieve uh, ordering of results is to use aggregation. We, with aggregation, we can compute values. Uh, for example, we could order films by the total number of awards that they have received. Again, this is a very coarse metric. Obviously, it's not just the number of awards, but the quality maybe of the awards that you might be interested in. But still, it's better maybe than having a random order or an order by um, alphabet only. Okay, but this is still very limited. And the problem, of course, is that these approaches are highly application dependent and limited to notions of importance that are relatively easy to obtain by a query. And the question now would be, are there more general ways of finding important vertices in a graph or some meaning of importance? And uh, once we have that, we could pre-compute such importance and store them in the database for quick retrieval if we want. Okay, now this leads us to networks. And uh, in 
networks, uh, we want to solve often similar questions. So that's something that uh, is studied in the field of network analysis. And in network analysis, um, we are usually um, interested in analyzing very simple graph structures. Usually the graphs we have there are unlabeled and they are sometimes directed, also they are sometimes undirected, that depends, but they are much uh, less uh, structured than the knowledge graphs that we have been usually working with um, in that they have only one type of connection in most cases. And uh, now network analysis has developed methods for um, ranking vertices by importance based solely on the structure of the network. And uh, this type of importance measures are called centrality measures. So centrality is the term used to refer to importance based on the position, maybe I should say, of a vertex inside such an unlabeled graph. <clears throat> now networks which can be studied like this uh, arise in many areas. For example, think of transportation networks or communication networks, in particular the internet itself, networks of links on the World Wide Web, um, but also, for example, in citation uh, networks, if um, publications cite other publications, that's a kind of link. There are social networks, of course, like Twitter and Facebook and so on. And there's uh, networks in science, for example, so that mirror chemical reactions or biological process interactions. So many, many things can be captured in a network. Um, which has only one type of connection, maybe. Maybe it's directed, maybe it's not. But uh, where the um, graph structure is a uniform kind of information. And of course, once you have such a network, for example, a transportation network or a um, network which describes chemical reactions, you can also store this inside a knowledge graph. So it is possible to store uh, a network usually as part of a knowledge graph. So for example, Wikipedia, uh, Wikidata, sorry, also has some aspects of networks uh, stored inside. So certainly you can figure out some transportation networks, some uh, uh, public transportation networks, underground stops and their connections are fully mapped inside Wikidata. Um, but there's so much more in Wikidata, of course, and it's, it's much less uniform. There's not just transportation, there's not just science, there's not just social connections between things, but there are many, many other things. And um, just forgetting about the different dimensions of Wikidata and just treating everything as one big uh, graph is probably not very helpful, not very interesting. So um, main message at this point, networks are also graphs, but they are different from knowledge graphs in a certain sense. They are more focused on plain structure and um, doing this makes most sense if this structure describes some uh, common phenomenon, which is the same throughout all of the network. So for example, connections in the road network, uh, they have a similar meaning no matter where in the world uh, you might consider them. And it might be then meaningful to study such a structure as a whole and to, to analyze it. And um, whereas with knowledge graphs, with the, you can have very different um, uh, topics and very different linking structures in different topics. And it is not uh, very meaningful to study it with a uniform approach based on the overall connectivity structure. And it's better to maybe focus on some part of it and then apply the methods that I'm talking about here. Okay, so that's network uh, analysis and their notion of centrality. Now, the big question, of course, even if you restrict to such a simple network is what does important really mean? When we say we want the most important results on top in a query, that's easy to say, but uh, in practice, it turns out uh, very challenging to figure out what is the most important result for a query. And um, of course, networks structures will only answer this question in part. It may, it's not the only way to answer this question. And um, it is uh, sometimes a good and sometimes not such a good way. But even if we are um, focusing on a pure network structure, there are still many different ways in which we could uh, define what is important to us. Let me just list to you some considerations of what we could look at here. So um, first of all, 
the question is what does the network even mean? So what kind of information is stored in this graph structure? And uh, the, the notions that is often underlying the uh, notions of centrality that I would like to present here is that networks often describe some kind of flow of something. It's clear for a transportation network on roads, of course, there's something flowing, goods, for example. Um, communication networks may have a flow of information, but also citation networks or um, links on the web might lead to a flow of readers, a flow of attention, credibility maybe, yes, if a, a very um, respectable source cites another paper that increases maybe its credibility and so on. So things flow in some abstract or concrete way. Now, once we have that idea of flow, we could say that a node is maybe more important if a lot flows from it. For example, in a supply chain, places where many things start might be important. No? That's the sources of, uh, of many um, other consumers. Or if it could be important if many things fly, flow to it. For example, in a network of links, if, if many people refer to the same web page or indirectly refer to it, then uh, this might be an important web page. But sometimes we also may think that flowing through a node makes it really important. For example, in communication, if you have a server which um, has to uh, reroute all the traffic of the internet, then this is really an important server, not because it's the end or the beginning of many um, paths, but it is uh, important in order to complete the paths. This also connects how say, the idea of flow, of course, with the graph uh, theoretic idea of a path. So if something flows, it flows through a certain trajectory and this we can model by a path, which we might weight by a certain number. So there might be some more important paths and some less important paths that could also play a role. Um, for example, by uh, considering their length. Uh, so that might make a path more interesting or less interesting for certain applications. Um, <clears throat> now, in general, paths uh, have many other aspects. Uh, it could be that only some of the paths are even interesting in the first place. We might want to look at only the shortest paths or only the ones which are vertex simple, so they don't have repeated vertices inside or edge simple, they don't have repeated edges. Or they could even just be very short and be one step paths and everything that's further away we don't care about. So there, this gives many different ideas of what importance could be. Um, also, um, it might be that there is a uh, relationship between the importance of paths and the importance of nodes. I could say that paths might be more important if they pass through an important node. Uh, of course, what is uh, important is for nodes is what we just are about to define. So um, of course, we could still have a certain prior idea of importance. So we might have some starting values for importance and use them in this computation, or we could do this in a purely recursive manner. And uh, saying somehow the importance of nodes or vertices is uh, feeding back into the importance of paths, which again feedback, feeds back into the importance of vertices and so on, until we hopefully converge to some meaningful notion. Okay, so these are ideas how to go about studying this. And as I already said, in <clears throat> knowledge graphs, um, we have to uh, often start much earlier and first figure out what is our network even consisting of. So just taking all of the links as a whole big network uh, will rarely lead to good results. So um, in this context, maybe the importance of edges and node does also depend on other complex features, for example, on the labels that we don't consider in the network structures that uh, network analysis focuses on, but which we have in knowledge graphs. Uh, and typically we will ignore some edges or vertices altogether in such an analysis. Right, so this is a, a set of first considerations of ideas that um, one can look at for this um, uh, idea of uh, defining importance. And as you can already see from that, there's many different um, perspectives one can take there. And this also leads to many different notions of importance. So there's no not one notion of centrality or one notion of universal importance that you can define with network theory, but um, roughly, rather you have many different 
options which you can choose from depending on your application depending on what you think is best for a certain uh, setting um, nevertheless it's still not as application specific as the examples that i gave you initially with the wikidata site links for example that would be really specific to one application whereas here we have uh, many measures that could in principle be applied to an arbitrary network but uh, which one is it makes sense in a concrete setting of course you still have to decide now um, let me start with a very simple example of such a centrality measure which is really easy to understand and to compute just to warm us up a bit uh, so this one is called decree centrality um, a very primitive form of centrality that simply looks at the incoming or outgoing paths of length one no other paths are considered um, we say the in-degree centrality of a directed graph is given by the in-degree of each node. So the centrality is a number and the number is simply the in-degree, the number of incoming edges. The out-degree centrality is the number of outgoing edges and generally the degree centrality, especially for undirected graphs, is uh, simply the number of um, incident edges that exist for a certain node so no matter whether they are incoming or outgoing <clears throat> okay so this is simply counting neighbors so to speak or counting the edges if uh, this is a multi-graph um, okay so that's this degree centrality and it seems very um, uh, trivial and simple but it still has its uses for example when i say that um, wikidata has this notion of site links which we can count in order to um, estimates the importance this is actually a kind of degree centrality which is pre-computed for us it's a number that is stored in the graph um, but we could also compute it by using aggregates this is what is written here the degree centrality can easily be computed in queries using counting aggregates we just have to do a count over the edges and um, we have already seen this in this variation uh, uh, in this uh, in wikidata okay so this is degree centrality um, advantages of this are obviously that it is very easy to compute it's also very easy to update so this is an important issue with uh, centrality measures if they are difficult to define the question is not just can you compute them after you know in a night of heavy computation but also can you keep them up to date when uh, things like wikidata changes every seconds uh, every few seconds and uh, this is very easy with uh, the uh, degree centrality it's very local property you can easily update it whenever you change something locally um, but uh, of course it also has some disadvantages uh, and uh, the obvious disadvantage is that it's so primitive to um, as a measure for importance it only looks into the direct neighborhood and therefore also is very easy to manipulate i mean if you are just given a graph um, by nature for example if it's a graph of protein interactions then you do not have to worry too much about uh, manipulation going on there but if your graph is the web and your importance measure decides how high up somebody will rank in your search results then you have to worry about whether this can be manipulated whether somebody could try to fool you in uh, uh, order to assign a higher importance to their node than to other nodes and this is very easy here obviously you just have to have a lot of neighbors which you could always create okay so for this reason and for many other reasons uh, there are more advanced notions of centrality that are studied and um, one i want to start with in this lecture in this video and then also continue with some variations of it in the next video and this is going to be the eigenvalue centrality and um, this notion of centrality starts with um, an idea that is called the random walker now how does that work well we can model flow in a network by asking where a particular thing uh, that moves randomly across the network would likely end up so important here we move randomly um, and what moves of course depends on the network if you have a transportation network maybe you think of a good uh, a vehicle with goods moving randomly and um, if you are on the web uh, then uh, moving means somebody clicking a link to another 
web page and it's much more justified to assume that this happens quite randomly yes people just click on things um, more often than they just uh, drive down some road with their lorries okay so something moves and um, we want to know where it would probably end up all other things being equal um, and this is what leads to the idea of a random walk so a walk like this may start at any node of the network with some probability by default we could just assume it's uniform it's uh, just one out of all of the nodes on the network with the same probability for each um, but it could be a different starting value if you want to, to change that yeah <clears throat> and then in each step um, the walk may continue along any edge in the direction of edges if the network is directed and with some probability so if we have three choices to make for, uh, then we could assign to each of the choices a probability and this is the probability for the random walker to walk along this path or take this step as the next one um, again default assumption would be that this is uniform that you take any path with equal probability but this too could be changed if you have other information that guides you in assigning different probabilities <clears throat> and the idea then is to measure the centrality of a node uh, by the probability of the random walker being in that location after a large number of steps. So the idea is that um, initially the probabilities are uniform maybe and then all these walkers start to walk and the question is then where do they end up in which part of the network will they eventually be found with, with what probability. And um, the hope is that this will somehow be well defined and will converge. Yeah. Okay. Now, the question, of course, is can we compute this? It's a nice model, but you do not want to have a million random uh, threads starting on the World Wide Web. Well, maybe you would need a hundred million there and um, simulate their decisions and then count uh, the, uh, how, how many of them end up in certain places after a certain time. So that seems to be excessively complicated and, and not, uh, not, not possible to compute. So we need to, be, to have a better way of computing this. And it turns out that for this model, this is actually relatively easy. Let's look at an example. So here is a little network. It's not quite the web. So we have only four vertices and we have some directed edges between them, as you can see here. <clears throat> now, I assume that the probability for the random walker to take any of these edges is uniform. So every edge gets the same chance of being used when the random walker is in a certain location. So for example, in location A, one could go to B, one could go to C, one could also go to D. All three are possible and I just assign probability one third to each. And this I can write up in a transition matrix where the probabilities that I just mentioned are in columns. Um, the fact that I put them in the column and doesn't, don't just transpose them to make it a row is purely um, uh, arbitrary in a certain sense. So uh, I think there are different authors doing it differently. We will use column vectors here with all the um, order of things that uh, results if you read a book where this, these probabilities for a are stored in a row you have to change things around yeah? transpose all the operations that we will be doing but it's not difficult okay so for a it's one third one third one third but there's zero probability of going to a there's no loop here for b it's one half to a and one half to d because these are the only two options that we have and so on and so forth for all the others. C has only one possible way to go. So this is certainty one and D again has two um, going to B and C. Okay, now I would like to simulate or think of the random walker on this um, little network. And uh, as I said, to start this, I will have to um, have an initial probability for being at the four locations in this case. And I will also choose this uniformly. So um, I will have one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth. Each node gets the same chance. And I write this like this here as a row vector in this case um, to mean the probability of A, B, C, and D being my current position. 
Now the question is, where will I probably be next? If, if this is what I know about my position now, and I know that I'm now going to make a step, I can't stand still, I have to move. What are the probabilities in the next step? So for example, what is the probability of being in A in the second step? Well, it's easy. It's the probability of coming into A by any possible path in this step. How could I come to A? Well, I could come from B or, or I could come from C. And you can see that these cases are also found in the row for A. So I have zero probability from for coming from A itself. I have 50% chance of coming from B if I would be at B. I have 100% chance of coming from C if I would be at C. And I cannot come from D either. So how do I now get my probability? Well, if I am at C, then I will certainly move at uh, to B and A in the next step. But I have only one quarter uh, chance to be in C. So I have to multiply these. So what I get is um, that I have to multiply one quarter of a probability, that's the chance of being in A. I multiply this with zero because if this is the case, I will not be in A in the second step. Then one quarter times one half is the chance of B having been in B and moving to A. One quarter times one is the chance of having been in C and moving to A. And zero again is the chance of coming from D. So overall, I get the value three eighths. Um, so you can already see the general mechanism here. We just take a sum over all the nodes. And for each, we take the probability of being in that node times the probability of walking from that node to the A node that we are interested in. This is how we compute the probability of being in A in the next step. And now we can uh, do this for all the nodes, not just for A, where we get three A's, but also for B, C, and D. And it turns out for them, the values are actually the same. Um, so for slightly different reasons, so with slightly different sums. Um, and well, as you can see here, these um, decimals here, we can also, or these, these numbers here, these rational numbers, we can express here with these decimals um, of this value roughly. So some things have changed. It's no longer 25% four times, but somehow some of them have been reduced here. Some of them have grown. Overall, this the, uh, sum of this still is one. Okay. And now I can continue, right? Now I know that with these probabilities, I'm in the nodes and I can apply the same process again and use still instead of one fourth, four times, I will use these probabilities in these places and do the same computation and update my vector. And if I do this, I get this series of vectors, um, which if you look at them may not tell you much. Now, these are the exact values, but if you look at the decimal approximations, you see that things are looking quite good. So we go from 0, 3, 1 to 0, 3, 4 to 0, 3, 3, and uh, also in the second and further positions, the values seem to get uh, changed by smaller and smaller amounts each step. So there's a certain hope, if you see this, of course, that this process might actually converge, that if we continue this for a while, the numbers will become very stable and um, we have uh, computed something which is maybe meaningful, possibly. Uh, so far, we just dumply computed something, whether it's meaningful or not, one would have to prove. So this is not uh, automatically given just uh, because of the uh, fact that it converges. Okay. Um, okay, but this computation, if we uh, continue it, will lead us to the concept of an eigenvector. So um, eigenvector, by the way, this is, of course, a German word. Eigen means self, um, comes from eigenvalue, eigenwert, uh, 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 as the German word would be. And um, yeah, a mathematical term that has made its way into English language as well. So um, eigenvectors uh, is what I want to explain. But as I said, the first step to uh, question to ask is maybe whether this iterative process in the example would converge to some limit. And at least for this example that I gave you, this looks, looked promising. And it turns out that indeed the, it does converge. And the value it converges to is actually uh, expressible with much smaller numbers here in the fractions than I was 
getting in the continued computation. And it's one third and two ninths for the remaining ones. But here you can see in the decimal places that we had already been relatively close to this after just four steps. Okay, so this is what it converges to. Now, what is that value? What did we get here? What characterizes this particular limit? Does it have any nice mathematical properties that uh, makes it um, interesting and worth computing in the first place? And um, well, it turns out that um, if I write this vector now, not as a row vector, but as a column vector, so from um, top to bottom instead of from left to right, then uh, we have the following um, equation uh, being true. So the matrix of probabilities multiplied by this vector is again the vector. Now I should maybe here have a little uh, t. So this is um, uh, the um, transposed version of this vector. Um, now so this is the uh, computation we can um, make here and um, it turns out that this is true for the for the matrix that we had and uh, matrix multiplication indeed was exactly the operation that we have iteratively applied in the example yeah? so what we essentially did there um, even though uh, i did it uh, note by note is what you would do in matrix multiplication as well so you you look at a whole row in the matrix and you look at all the color all the values in the column vector and you take a combination of of the matching pairs multiply them to get the next value at the first position for the first row second position at the second row and so on okay so if we have a limit like this then it has it satisfies this equality and now um, we can come to the notion of eigenvectors so given a square matrix m of real values uh, real numbers, a uh, so-called right eigenvector of M uh, is a column vector V, um, not transposed, I'm not sure what I was talking here, yeah? so just column vector uh, V uh, that is not the zero vector, and so zero vector doesn't just have zeros in it, and for which there is a real number, lambda, uh, such that M times V is equal to lambda times V. In this case, the lambda is called the eigenvalue of m. So this is a general mathematical definition of what an eigenvector and an eigenvalue is. Well-known concepts in mathematics, you probably have seen that in your uh, algebra uh, courses, undergraduate courses, so I'm not telling you any new things here. Um, but uh, the new thing, of course, is that we now want to use it to estimate the importance of nodes. And so this is going to give us a type of centrality. Um, so I say here the emerging centrality criterion is called the eigenvector centrality. Maybe we should clarify how does it actually emerge? What emerges here? Well, what we computed is a vector and it has one entry for every node in the network. And this entry is a number, in our case, between zero and one. The idea is that this number gives the importance, the relative importance of the node as compared to the other nodes. So you see, in our case, the first node would somehow be more important than the other nodes in this particular vector. Okay, so that is the idea. Um, define a centrality by this equation. Find this vector and then you're done. Okay, right. Um, there are some question marks that we have to uh, find answers for, I guess. If you if, uh, follow this, you might, you might have some questions yourself, yeah. So first of all, something that I should remark is that, of course, uh, any eigenvector can be multiplied by a scalar. Since the vector v appears on both sides of the equality, if we just multiply its, its different um, coordinates, its parts, by a, any number, then this multiplication will affect the value on the left and on the right equally. So uh, there is another eigenvector uh, for the same eigenvalue. So the eigenvalue stays the same. The lambda is always... Uh, the value we have, but the vector itself can be multiplied by any non-zero uh, number <clears throat> to get another eigenvector. So we have a lot of choice which one we want to pick. 
commonly one uh, what one does is uh, one normalizes the eigenvectors so that the sum is one of course only for positive eigenvectors there could be negative numbers in here i guess so um, for positive ones we would normalize them so that say is the component sum up to one because then we can interpret them as probabilities but of course if you are only interested in ranking by importance then uh, the um, exact values are not important it's only the question what is more important what's less important not exactly uh, what's the absolute value of the of this component of this centrality is so centrality is always a measure which is for comparing to other nodes and so uh, multiplying all the centralities with a non-zero number does not change anything in this ranking that we would get from it okay <clears throat> Of course, um, this is not the only reason why there could be multiple eigenvectors. It's not just because uh, we can multiply each of them with any number. Uh, there can also be completely different eigenvectors for different eigenvalues. And this is a um, general property again, which you should know from mathematics. So the eigenval eigenvector is not unique or the eigenvalue is also not unique. So uh, matrix can have several such vectors. So this raises some questions, doesn't it? Because if we want to define a centrality and then we have several different vectors with different rankings, maybe some of them even with negative numbers in them, um, this wouldn't really work, right? So this would somehow would, would somehow not make much sense. So we have to clarify why we can assume that there is exactly one eigenvector for this centrality to be a meaningfully defined concept. And <clears throat> so, this is listed here. So to define a centrality measure, we still need some guarantees. A well-defined specific eigenvector among all possible ones, where all components of the vector should be non-negative, because a negative centrality would be rather strange, negative importance, um, and which can be computed in a practical fashion. Yes. So all three things are relevant in order to get a useful uh, measure in practice. Um, and well, thankfully, we will find that all of these issues are resolved in many common cases. So this is something that actually happens. But uh, I just want to point out that up to this point, you do not know uh, anything that would um, ensure that this is actually the case. So by all that you know so far, you might assume that there are many different eigenvectors which have different rankings and which are not easy to compute. Of course, I mean, we did one way to compute it, maybe with iteration, but this will give you at most one result, right? What is what with the others? Is that even the one that you want? And so on. So there's many, many questions, but somehow the world is very kind to us here and uh, things fall into place and, and work as we would like them to work um, in many cases. Now, what are these cases where it actually works nicely? And uh, for these cases, there is a concept um, of what is called an irreducible matrix. Um, now, there's many ways of defining this, but I choose here one which I think you hopefully will find simple. So I'm looking at an n times n matrix M of non-negative real numbers. And uh, any such matrix, no matter what the numbers are, whether they are probabilities or something completely different, gives rise to a directed graph G of M, which has n vertices, and where you have an edge from one vertex to another if and only if the entry at the position ij in the matrix is greater than zero. So we have non-negative real numbers, but they can be zero. And for those which are greater than zero, we say that there's an edge. Okay, so it's very similar to what we have just done in our little example. Um, there I have assigned specific numbers to the edges, but uh, the important thing is that there is a non-zero number for every place where there is an edge. And now I say that such a matrix is irreducible if this graph is strongly connected. So if I can go on a directed path from any node to any other node. So there is uh, always a way to go to any other place just following the direction of the um, arrows. Okay, and this was what we have just seen in the example. So in fact, any stochastic matrix where the columns express non-zero, but um, 
not really necessarily uniform transition probabilities in some strongly connected path is irreducible. So if you have a strongly connected graph you start from and you assign all the edges some probabilities, um, then this will give you an irreducible matrix. Just one of many ways of getting such a nice matrix. Okay, so this is what we call an irreducible matrix. And now uh, there's an important result in this area, which is called the peron frobenius theorem, um, which states in one version here uh, the following. So consider a square matrix M of non-negative real numbers, just like what we had above. If this matrix is irreducible, then first item M has an eigenvalue R that has the highest absolute value among all eigenvalues and that is positive. The highest absolute value. So there could be negative eigenvalues, but this eigenvalue has the highest absolute even when compared to the negatives. So it's farther away from zero than any of them and it is positive. It's not negative, it's strictly greater than zero. So such an eigenvalue exists, some one, the highest absolute value eigenvalue. Uh, and M has a right eigenvector V with this eigenvalue R whose components are all positive. So there you are. This gives us our unique, most interesting, best uh, uh, centrality ready eigenvector. So because this theorem tells us that among all the possible solutions to this equation, among all possible eigenvectors, there is one which is special, one which is, uh, has, is belonging to the um, eigenvalue that is the largest and has the largest absolute value too. And this particular eigenvector has also the nice probability that all its components are positive. So we don't have to deal with negative importance values. They will all be um, positive. And uh, so they can be directly and immediately interpreted as centrality scores. Nice. So this is a useful and wonderful Perron Fabrenio theorem. I will not prove it here. It's just for your information to give some sense to this otherwise rather stupid uh, iterated um, computation. Uh, where of course you can always say, oh, we just we just iterate. Something will come out of it. Yeah, but this is not a very very uh, smart uh, way of doing things. Yes, normally when you mm, compute, you want to know why and what, what's the result of this is. And this is one uh, possible viewpoint uh, with this theorem that tells you that there is a result and um, that it's, it's worthwhile what you're doing. Of course, technically, so far I haven't talked at all about iteration. So this um, theorem just tells us that there is a nice eigenvector, one which is worth uh, striving for if you want a centrality measure, but it doesn't really tell us uh, how to get it and whether this is the one we will get with um, the iterative procedures that I have shown you. Uh, and um, this is something else that can be proven and I will not go into the details. It's actually true for many even more general cases that the eigenvalue with the largest absolute value can be found by iterated matrix multiplication starting from any initial vector. So that's another thing which we haven't really discussed so far. So I just started with some uniform probability of being in any of the nodes. What happens if you start somewhere else? And uh, what I'm saying here is that it doesn't matter. If you start with uh, any initial vector, it might take a bit longer if you start in a very unlucky position, but overall, it will uh, not have a big impact may, uh, on the overall result. So you will converge to the one and only uh, uh, best uh, Peron Frobenius uh, style eigenvector if you do this iterated uh, computation. Now, that's quite nice, isn't it? It's uh, uh, quite amazing how everything works together in order to please us and make it easy for us here. So for common met networks and stochastic matrices that you so common in the sense that you find them in applications, this computation with the iteration actually converges very quickly um, in comparison to the size of the network. Um, moreover, it has a nice probability of working well using floating point arithmetic. It also allows for effective parallelization. Now, parallelization with matrix multiplication, that should not come as a surprise. Uh, there's a lot of parallel computers that love doing matrix multiplication, starting with your graphics card. And um, of course, uh, this is a typical 
parallelizable operation matrix multiplication. So that's uh, a good thing to, to start with if you want to scale out, uh, scale out very much. Um, but the other thing, floating point arithmetic is actually also good news. Um, as you hopefully know uh, from computer science courses, floating point numbers are uh, nowhere near real, real numbers. Yes, they have very strange properties. They have holes, they are unevenly distributed and they lack precision. And um, so in my example, I had worked with rationals, which I showed you as to you as fractions, but it turns out actually that this is not necessary. I could have worked with the somewhat approximated decimal versions that I had there too, and it would still have converged. So this convergence is not so um, brittle that it would be destroyed if you do a bit of approximation here or there. It's a very robust uh, convergence that works even if your calculation is not 100% precise. Good thing. Okay, so um, there are some restrictions, obviously, because I have required that um, the matrix is irreducible or um, equivalently that the graph is strongly connected. Uh, and what does that actually mean, strongly connected? Well, there are two kinds of structures that are um, preventing strong connectivity. The one is what is called a dead end. Dead end is what you would think it is at a cul de sac, a place where you cannot continue further. Uh, so uh, you have a vertex there which has no outgoing edges. So if a random walker ends up in this vertex, since you have to move, you cannot stay in the same place in the next uh, uh, step, the random work walker essentially will just fall off a cliff and uh, all the probability of being anywhere will be gone. So a dead end is bad. Um, the other thing which is bad are so-called spider traps. So these are cyclic structures where you can go around in circles. There are no dead ends there, but you cannot go back to all the nodes. You can just go to certain uh, places inside the spider trap. Why is this called a spider trap? Well, because a web crawler is also called a spider. And so if a web crawler like the one of a, a search engine is uh, going through the web and it gets into such a substructure where the links are only going round and round, but never back to the rest of the web, this is a spider trap. So it can uh, trap a crawler, so to speak. It will not um, find its way out. And uh, okay, I already gave you the intuitive explanation for these two structures being problematic. So the dead ends are the ones where we go over the cliff edge and lose the uh, probability weight. And if you have um, a lot of paths towards such a dead end, then eventually all the random walkers will be uh, going that way and uh, the uh, result will converge to zero. There will not be a probability left that you are still in your graph because everyone is uh, jumping down this uh, this uh, cliff, which is uh, obviously bad and something we do not want to happen. Spider traps are not quite as destructive, but they are also problematic because they will drain the weight from all the other uh, vertices that just have a path towards the trap but are not part of the trap. So once a walker is in the trap, it can only move around and eventually all the walkers with some probability will end up there. So eventually the centrality of the nodes, which are not part of the trap, will be down to zero and only the, the nodes inside the spider trap will still have a non-zero value. Okay, so these are two cases where iterative computation does not lead to good results and where you cannot apply this. So. Um, on one hand, this is kind of obvious. On the other hand, uh, it should be also a, a little warning to those of you who thought, oh, well, you know, why do we have to study the math of this? Just let's do some iterative computation, looks good. So let's just apply that and get the value. So this is not so easy. So these uh, structures are problematic and the theorems that I showed you explain why they are problematic. And um, now one can think of uh, possible solutions of how to avoid these issues and uh, this is what I will talk about in my next video. Uh, see you soon. Bye bye.